evening. Welcome to, Waterway, welcome to the Waterway Speaker Series. Uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones if you haven't already. I'm Susan Doley, board member of Riverscape, a nonprofit organization with a focus on the beautification and redevelopment of the Wabash River Corridor in Vigo County. Riverscape has been a catalyst, as many of you know, for, for many changes, including the Wabashiki Wetlands, Bicentennial Park, and the pedestrian connector across what is locally known as the Grade from the Wabash River into Terre Haute, into West Terre Haute. Riverscape is pleased to bring waterways to West Terre Haute, one of six small towns in Indiana selected to host the exhibit. Waterways is a Smithsonian Institution traveling exhibition that reveals the central nature of water in our lives. It is made possible by the Museum on Main Street partnership between the Smithsonian and Indiana Humanities and the support of many local community partners and volunteers, some of whom I see in the audience here tonight. Riverscape's companion exhibit, Pearls of the Wabash, explores the local community's history and relationship to the Wabash River. Both exhibits are at the Vigo County School Corporation's new administration building at 501 West Olive Street in West Terre Haute through January 2nd. So this is a great activity if you've got kids visiting or kids in your family or just want to go see something over the holidays. It is open every day except Christmas, I believe, and not open on Mondays. Um, in partnership with Vigo County Public Library, we are excited to also offer this Waterway Speaker Series, which taps regional experts on the local history, life, and health of the Wabash River watershed. For this 10th presentation in the Waterway Speaker Series, I have the honor of introducing to you Diane Hunter, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and a citizen of the tribe. Diane is a descendant of the Miami family of Sekakweta and Palangswa through their son, Wapanaki Kapwa. Diane works to preserve and protect historic sites and resources she provides education about the presence and history of the Miami tribe and serves more than 800 tribal citizens in Indiana. Diane has a bachelor's degree from Indiana University and master's degrees from Ball State University and Georgetown University. I know we are all looking forward to hearing Diane talk about the history of Miami Yaki, their connection with waterways throughout their history and their presence in Indiana today. And so thank you for your interest. And without further ado, I present Diane Hunter. Aya. Te pewe ne o la kakoke o wahanungi kakikwe. Checha koko o wains wiane. Nila mita seni a mia mikwea. Ilapa kasiane seka kweta nehe polanswa. I just introduced myself to you in Miami Atawenge, the Miami language. I pretty much said just what Susan has <laughs> said about me. What I'd like to do this evening is to talk about the history of Miami people, our connections to waterways throughout our history, and also to talk about the Miami tribe of Oklahoma today. I always like to begin at the beginning. Mitame miamiake nipungonje sakachawe cheke. At first, the Miamis came out of the water. That's the first line of our oldest story. It's the story of our emergence as unique and different people. Before we came out of the water, we believe based on some of our stories that we came from the north, but we don't know exactly where we were or who we were. But we came out of the water and became a people who came to be known as Miamiake, Miami people. So you can see that waterways have been important to Miami people from our beginning, from our very beginning. Water has been important to us. The place that we came out of the water, we called Sakiweonge. Right here. It's on the St. Joseph River. And St. Joseph River that goes at South Bend, 
because there are two St. Joseph rivers in Indiana. Um, but somewhere between South Bend and Lake Michigan is Saki Weonge, where we came out of the water, we started a village. And we lived in that village for, we don't know how long, but for a long time. And then people started to move out and move away. We don't know exactly why people left Saki Weonge, but we know why people left villages at a later time. And that was generally because a village became too large to be sustained in one place. People needed to move away to another place so that they could grow enough crops, that they could gather enough food, that they could, could hunt enough meat uh, to sustain the village. So we can assume that that was probably at least one of the reasons why people left Sakiweonge. The first people who left went to a place that later came to be known as Kikayonge. Today, Kikayonge is called Fort Wayne. One of the reasons I think that people stopped when they got to Kikayonge is you may be aware that at Fort Wayne, there's the confluence of three rivers. We almost always built our villages on rivers and particularly at confluences. So it makes sense that when we got to three rivers that came together, great place to stop. But most of our villages that we know about today were on the Wapashike Sipiwe. And you all know what I mean by that. Most people generally don't, but you all know that I mean the Wabash River. And so our villages along the Wapashiki Sipiwe were at various confluences. So there was Kinetikomekwa at the Eel River, and Katepekwana at the Tippecanoe River. There was Peongishyonge at the, uh, oh, excuse me, I forgot, Wayatononge at Wildcat Creek, Pekishyonge at the Vermilion River, and Achepekyonge at the Embarrass River. And I don't know how that's pronounced in English, but. <laughs> So, as I say, we always pick those places where there were confluences. And why did we do that? We did it because water was so important to our lives. Water was important, of course, water is important to all our lives. And, and water was, was important for the same reasons to us then as it is to us now. But there were other reasons that we chose to live um, on rivers and at confluences. We were farmers, our women were farmers, and we grew corn. We had huge cornfields. In fact, um, when the Americans came, they said they had never seen such large cornfields as we had. Each village had a large cornfield. And we built those cornfields along the rivers. Why would we do that? These are rivers that flooded. So when the river floods, it would bring really rich soil along the riverbanks. Now today, of course, it brings chemical runoff, but they didn't have that in those days. And so the, that was perfect soil. We know that corn depletes the soil, but if the, if the soil is replenished with, with floods every year, we don't have to move the, the field. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't get floods. But that was important to us to build or to have our cornfields right along the rivers. Of course, we fished. Um, we got a variety of fish uh, for food. Um, probably catfish, perch, sturgeon, gar, um, a variety of fish. <coughs> Excuse me, I have just a cold, so don't worry. It's not anything worse than that. 
The waterways were also important to us for transportation. If you look at the maps here, you can't really quite see it well on here, but you could start at the Great Lakes, really back as far as what we call the St. Lawrence Seaway today, and you could go by water all the way from the Great Lakes by river down to the Gulf of Mexico. You could go the whole way by water, except for about a six mile patch of land just west of what is today Fort Wayne. Miami people controlled that portage as it came to be known. So anybody who was transporting goods down the rivers got to the St. Mary's River and they had to pay us to carry their boats and carry their, their goods over to the Little River. It was really very profitable. So rivers have been important to us from the very beginning. Now, our first contact with Europeans came by way of disease and trade goods. We got European goods long before we saw European faces. And then we first saw the French. When the Wyandots came to us and they said, you've got to come up to the lake, Lake Huron. You've got to see these really strange looking people. And we think they're dangerous. You've got to help us defend against them. So we went with them, and there were five boats with these really strange looking people. And so when they got off the boats, we attacked them. And everybody that got off the boats, we killed, and the rest of them took off. Now, we have this story passed down to us through our stories, through our history. The French don't tell that story. They don't have a record of it probably didn't want to go home and say that they got attacked and killed. <clears throat> so the next time we encountered the French was in the mid 1600s, it was the Beaver Wars. And the war was coming west toward us. And we did not want to be a part of it. We wanted to get out, get away from it. So we went west into what is today Illinois, north into what is today Wisconsin, and, and into uh, what is today Michigan. And it was while we were in uh, Wisconsin, Illinois area, that we encountered the French face to face in a little more uh, pleasant um, encounter. Um, they were French Jesuit missionaries and French traders. And we did like those trade goods. They were wonderful. Ladies, think about it. Your whole life, you've been cooking in a clay pot. Now, I don't know about you, but I am sure that it would happen to me that I've got dinner in the pot, it's ready to go, I'm carrying it to my family, I trip, and not only does everything spill, the pot breaks, and the whole dinner's gone, right? I imagine it happened with some frequency, right? But now they've got metal pots. They don't break. And they cook better than clay pots. So yeah, I'm sure that we were very happy with those pots and with a lot of the things that we got in trade with the French. So in the early 1700s, after the war was over and it was safe for us to come back to our, our same villages where we had been before, the French came too and they continued to trade with us. And then by the mid 1700s, we were also trading with the British. Then in 1763, there was the Treaty of Paris. And in that treaty, the French ceded to the British their rights in Miyabionge, in our land. Now, the French, at least the French on the ground with us, understood their rights were they could trade with us, they could live where we allowed them to, and they had diplomatic rights with us. The British clearly thought that when they got the land, that they got the land and that they were in charge. 
We didn't like them telling us what to do. But then things got worse with the Treaty of Paris in 1783, when the British ceded the land to the Americans. And the Americans not only thought this was now their land, they started coming onto the land. We hadn't been at those treaties. We hadn't ceded the land, we hadn't given the land away, we hadn't sold it. As far as we were concerned, it was still our land. And here come these people, they're cutting down our trees, they're building houses on our land, and we want them out. They don't belong here. And so we attacked them, and they attacked us. And that led to lots of skirmishes, and eventually it led to the US government sending out the army. There were several battles, some of which we were very successful at. But then in 1794, there was the Battle of Fallen Timbers, and we lost. <coughs> we were surprised. We had defeated them so soundly in the past, and yet here they came with more men. They had more, more men to fight. But you know what, we didn't have more men. We had the men that we'd had before, we were not going to get any more. When men, our men were killed in battle, there was no one to replace them. And not only that, but even when we won, the Americans would burn our cornfields, burn our villages, destroy our food stores. We realized we can't keep this up. This is not the kind of war that we're used to. It's not the kind of war that we can sustain. So we were very ready to go to the treaty table. And so in the Treaty of Greenville, 1795, we agreed to cede most of what is today Ohio and some portions of what is today Indiana. And that was okay, that was good. Because they had their land, we had our land, we were going to live as good neighbors in peace. But then people started coming further. And they started coming into what is southern Indiana and further in and further in. And every time they came a little further, they wanted us to have another treaty, cede more land. So there was a series of treaties. There was the Treaty of 1805 and then 1809. Now I want to pause here and think about what comes after 1809. 1816, Indiana becomes a state, right? This was Indiana in 1816. All the rest of that was still ours. We hadn't ceded it yet. But then 1818, we ceded a huge chunk of what is today Indiana. Then in 1826, we ceded everything north, or almost everything north of the Wapashikisipiwe, the Wabash River. But this was different at this treaty. They didn't just want us to, to sell them the land. They wanted us to exchange the land for land west of the Mississippi River. And they wanted us to go there. But we were having none of that. There's no way we were going to go. And they had no way to force us to do that. And the Americans said it was impossible to procure the assent of the Potawatomis or Miamis to a removal west of the Mississippi. They are not yet prepared for this important change in their situation. Clearly the Americans saw this is coming. No, maybe not yet, but it's coming. But they still had no way to force it until the Indian Removal Act in 1830, which opened the way for that land exchange. 
that they wanted in 1826. And then in 1832, they passed, Congress passed an act to enable the president to extinguish Indian title within the states of Indiana, Illinois, and the territory of Michigan. So now the door to Indian removal is open wide. And in 1832, just a couple of months after this law passed, they came to our council house in, on the forks of the Wabash. So again, right on the rivers where everything's important on the rivers. And they wanted to make a treaty with us. But not only make a treaty, they wanted us to go west. So the, co the conversation that first day went something like this. You should go west. We will not go. Think about it. We need a definite answer. We will not go. We'll talk about it again tomorrow. Next day, they come back. The conversation is exactly the same. They're insistent and we are adamant. And this went on for several negotiations and we just were not going to do it. But finally, in 1834, we did sign a treaty to cede more pieces of land. And it went to President Andrew Jackson's desk and there were provisions in that treaty that he didn't like. So he wouldn't sign it. He wanted the land, but because he didn't get all his, his way in the treaty, he wouldn't sign it. So the Treaty of 1834 wasn't signed until November of 1837, three years later, when the new president, Van Buren, signed the treaty, sent it to us, and then we signed that final treaty in, in November 1837. Now, the ink wasn't even dry on the paper when the Americans turn to us and say, we want to negotiate another treaty. And a year later, in November of 1838, we sign another treaty, cede more land. All the tribal land that we have left now is the Great Miami Reserve. And you can see there that Kokomo today is right in the middle of the Great Miami Reserve. The Treaty of 1838 was unique compared to the previous treaties in a couple of ways. One is that we agreed to consider going west of the Mississippi River. We did not say we would go, but we said that we would consider it. I think we were beginning to realize that life here was not going to be good for us. That we might not be able to succeed as a people, to thrive as a people, if we stayed in this land. But we weren't ready to give in yet. The other provision of this treaty that's important to note is that Penjewa, Jean-Baptiste Jean Richardville, our principal chief was given an exemption from any removal that would occur. So if the tribe was removed, he and his family would not have to be removed. They could remain in Fort Wayne. The treaty tells us why. He was an old man. Um, he was 77 years old, and I don't think 77 is all that old. <laughs> But in 1838, there weren't very many people who lived that long, and there were not many Miami men who were that old. Some women, but not many men. And he was sick. And it was really thought that if he were to be removed, he would not survive removal. And so he was exempted if removal occurred. 
And then, two years later, in 1840, we signed another treaty. We agreed to exchange the Great Miami Reserve for land west of the Mississippi. That same kind of exchange that they had been asking for us for 14 years, since 1826. And even more significantly, we agreed to be removed to that land west of the Mississippi within five years. Now, this treaty also held exemptions. There was an exemption for the family of Palanzwa, Francois or Francis Godfroy. He had recently passed, but his will provided that his land could not be sold until his youngest child turned 21. His youngest child was four years old. So, if they were removed, nobody would be there to protect his vast land holdings. And he did have a lot of land. And they would lose their inheritance if they were all removed west of the Mississippi. So his family was exempted. There was an, also an exemption for Mishinguamisha and his band. They're, that band lived somewhat differently than other Miami people. They lived somewhat separately. They had a reserve just for their village. It was the only village reserve that was still left. And they didn't have debts. Many, many Miami people, most Miami people had great debts, but they did not. And so it was felt that they would, it would be fine for them to remain and not be removed. But nobody wanted to go. Nobody wanted to leave their homes. All those leaders who signed the treaty in 1840, they didn't want to go. They just saw no alternative but to, but to sign that treaty. And as the time went on, of course the Americans wanted us to leave right away, but we put it off. We can't go this year, we have to harvest our crops. We can't go this year, we haven't sold our land yet. And so we kept putting it off and putting it off. Near the end of the five years, a Miami woman named Maconzequa, you might know her as Frances Slocum, she got an exemption from congressional legislation for herself and for her family. One of the reasons she claimed that she needed the exemption was that she had land. She had her own land, her family was all here, and she could take care of herself. She and her family could take care of themselves. They didn't need to be dependent on other people. And so then some of the other leaders who also had their own land thought, hmm, it worked for her. And so they started seeking exemptions as well. But they didn't come through, at least not in time. We passed the five years. We passed the five years by several months. And in September of 1846, the U.S. Army arrived to round us up from our villages and take us to a prison camp in Peru. Now, there were some people, the, the people in the bands of Wawiyasata and Pepaquicha, Pepaquicha is also known as Flatbelly, and the Pigeon family from Turtle Town. As soon as they heard the uh, army was here, they fled north. They said, we're not going west, we'll go north. And they sought refuge among the Pokagon Potawatomi in Michigan. But everyone else was rounded up from their villages and taken to this prison camp in Peru. On October 6, 1846, I'll do the math for you, that's 175 years ago, five canal boats 
On the Wabash and Erie Canal, yes, even man-made waterways were important to Miami people. Five canal boats left Peru with about 325 Miamiaki, Miami people, on board. We took the Wabash and Erie Canal east. We passed our villages. We passed our homes. We went through Fort Wayne and remembered that was Kikayonga. That's where my grandfather lived. That's where my relatives lived. You can just imagine people reminiscing as they passed these places that they knew they would never see again. When they got to Ohio, they switched to the Miami and Erie Canal, which they took south to Cincinnati. Well, this is a photo of Cincinnati taken in 1848, so less than two years after we were there. So I'm, I, I think that must have been what Cincinnati looked like when we arrived. They got us off the canal boats, marched us down Main Street, right here's Main Street, to the public landing. And they boarded us on the steamboat Colorado. Now, as far as I know, neither of these boats is the, the Colorado, but I can imagine that this might be similar to what the Colorado looked like. The Cincinnati newspapers every day published the shipping news, what was coming into Cincinnati from the canals and what was leaving Cincinnati by steamboat. I'd like to read this to you. Daily receipts by the Miami Canal, 134 barrels of whiskey, 218 barrels of flour, 10 sacks of 115 pounds of wool, two Indian ponies, Miami Indians 225 over and 78 under eight years old, 49 perch stones, four pigs, and so on and so on. Shipments to St. Louis by the Colorado, 30 tons of dry goods, 32 casts of government stores, 350 Indians with their baggage. It's very clear that we were not passengers on these boats. We were cargo, right along with the varnish and the pigs. So the Colorado took us on the Ohio River and then to the Mississippi and we started north on the Mississippi River. We'd been sick from the very beginning. We weren't used to boat travel and we, many of us were sick. But on October 18th, we had our first death. It was an infant, a child from Wawiasita's band. And I told you that the people from Wawiasita's band fled north, but apparently not all of them did because this family was on the boat. I think about the mother of this child holding her dead baby, wondering why, why she didn't flee? Why was she on this boat? I have to think she must have thought, if I had fled, maybe my baby would still be alive. We don't know why she didn't flee. There were babies born on the boat, so maybe this was a newborn and she thought as nine months pregnant that she couldn't flee, or she felt like carrying a baby and fleeing was just not viable either, and it would be safer to go on the boats. In any case, here she is now on the Colorado, holding her baby, waiting to bury him. Two days later, on October 20th, we had another death. This time it was an elder man named Ottawa. And later that day, we arrived at St. Louis. But they didn't take us into St. Louis. They put us on a sandbar called Bloody Island. And it was there on Bloody Island that we buried the Wawiasita infant and Ottawa with our traditional funeral service.
the Mississippi River, if you remember that first map I showed you, the Mississippi River is the very edge of Miami It's the very edge of land that was familiar to us. And so these two were buried in the homeland. And the rest of us were about to leave the homeland, crossing past into unknown and possibly dangerous territory. We waited on Bloody Island for three days. The removal contractors had not planned on finding a new boat in St. Louis. But the Colorado and boats that can go on the Ohio and Mississippi are far too big to go on the very shallow Missouri River. So it took them three days to find the Clermont number no. two to take us on the Missouri River. We started west. During this part of the journey, the reports say that two-thirds of us were sick. Now that's about 200 people. I, I can't imagine being on a boat with 200 sick people. And there were four more deaths, all children. On November 1st, we arrived at the Kansas Landing, also known as the Westport Landing, in the town of Kansas today's Kansas City, Missouri. We camped outside of the town that night and the next day we started our journey south to Sugar Creek in what is today Kansas to the new Miami Reservation. It was early November. We arrived on November 4th and 5th. It was unusually cold. I mean, we've been having some warm December days, but that year, early November was bitterly cold. People were still sick. There were no houses there for us. We had to live in tents and people were dying. From the time we left Peru on October 6th, until the end of 1846, at least 30 Miami people died. That's almost 10% of us who were on removal who died. One who died was named Shapakana, Thomas Godfroy. Now Thomas was the son of Palanzwa. And if you remember, I said that Palanzwa and his his descendants were exempted from removal. But Thomas was a 16-year-old boy, and his friends and relatives were going on that boat. They had to go. And he wanted to go with them. He wanted to go and protect them and take care of them and make sure that they arrived safely. But he himself did not arrive safely. On December 24th, 1846, there was a letter from Tupia, Francis LaFontaine, our principal chief, and it said Thomas Godfrey is very sick. His recovery is doubtful. We have another letter from January 31st, 1847, just a month later, from Seca Cueta. Seca Cueta was Palanzwa's widow, Thomas's mother. When she heard that Thomas was likely dead by the time she received the letter, she said, I do assure you, it is a pang to my heart. And what I feel so bad is that he died without my seeing him. She blamed Joseph Sinclair. Sinclair was the removal agent. And she hadn't wanted Thomas to go, but Sinclair had promised him, I'll make sure he gets back. When I come back, I'll make sure he comes back with me. And so she says, Seca Cueta says, it was under that promise that I consented to let him go, that God's will be done. 
I relied on him as a white man of honor and a father to us, but he belied me. I imagine that's what every mother who lost a child at this time must have felt. Honestly, I think it must be what every Miami, every Miami person felt at that time because everyone had loss. Whether they went on removal or whether they were exempted, there was loss to every Miami person. It was a hard winter. But then, things got better. We built our houses, we started businesses, we built a mill, we built a blacksmith shop. Things were getting good. It was a good life. It was actually better than we had for a long time. And then, squatters started coming onto our land cutting down our trees, building up their houses on our land. Sound familiar? It's the same story. Also, Kansas had become a state. This was Kansas. All these colorful spots are tribal reservations. This side is Missouri. Kansas didn't have any money. New states didn't have any money. So they got this idea, they would just incorporate all the tribal reservations into Kansas and tax the land. They couldn't do that. These are sovereign nations. You can't, a state can't take a sovereign nation's land and tax it. But we had to go to court to fight it. So that was not pleasant. And then in the 1860s, there's the Civil War. I don't think we're taught a lot in Indiana schools about the Civil War being fought on the Missouri border, but it was. They say the Missouri-Kansas border, but that's not the Kansas border here yet. This is our land. Missouri bushwhackers are trying to push slavery into Kansas, and they're coming onto tribal lands to do it. They never actually fought on our land, on our reservation, but there was the Battle of Osawatomi, which was right here, within five miles of our homes. And the only way they could have gotten there was to ride right through our land. They were terrifying. Our women were still farming, but they were afraid to go into the cornfields because if those men came through when they were alone out in the cornfields, who knows what might happen. So things weren't so good anymore. And after the Civil War, the United States wanted us to remove again. This time they wanted us to remove south to Indian Territory, today's Oklahoma. And because things were so bad, we agreed to remove. And so the tribe removed south to what is now northeastern Oklahoma on the Neosho River. We were on rivers in Indiana, we were on Sugar Creek and the Lacine River in Kansas. Now we were, were on the Neosho River in Oklahoma. Still, rivers are important to us. I'm going to jump ahead about 50 years to 1936. There's the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. And under that act, we reorganized as the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and we ratified our Constitution in 1939. That Constitution provided that those Miami people who had come to Oklahoma from Kansas 
They were all listed, and those were the people who would be the citizens of the Miami tribe. Well, that left out the people who had remained in Indiana, the people who had remained in Kansas. In 1996, the tribe amended that constitution and opened enrollment to another list that today virtually everyone who is of Miami descent can now be a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. So the tribe went west, and as I said, some people stayed behind in Indiana, were exempted. There was a lot of back and forth between Indiana and Kansas, Indiana and Oklahoma. But we were a divided people. Today our population centers are northeastern Oklahoma, eastern Kansas, and northeastern Indiana. But we have citizens all over the country. Some even live internationally. We are a divided people. And what happens when we are divided is that we have small groups or even just families who are surrounded by people of a different culture, who don't share our Miami culture. And what happens in those cases is we become assimilated to the culture around us. And then we begin to forget our own culture. So many aspects of our culture went to sleep. Our last speakers, our last fluent speakers of our language died in the 1960s. But then in the 1990s, we began a reawakening, a revitalization of our culture, our language. And that is continuing on today. So today the Miami tribe of Oklahoma it has our seat of government in the town of Miami, Oklahoma. And every year in June at our annual meeting, we gather together to elect our leaders. That's when we elect those people who are going to carry on the business of the tribe every day. But they are not the primary governing body. By our constitution, the primary governing body is the general council. The general council is everyone, every Miami person 18 years and older who shows up at the annual meeting and votes. So we elect our leaders, and here they are. These are our current leaders. Uh, Doug Langford is our chief currently. And these are our other elected leaders. And at our annual meeting, we not only elect them, but in a very Miami way, we tell them what they are going to do in the next year. Our leaders are servant leaders, and their role is to do the will of the people. An example of this um, occurred a few years ago when someone said, you know what, we need to do more for our veterans. And we all agreed at the annual meeting that's what we need to do. And so, within the next year, they started providing a medical benefits card for every Miami person who was a veteran. It was a way to serve those people, and it was a way to meet the desire of the general council. So, our government, on a daily basis, these people make decisions, but they make the decisions that they believe that we want them to make and carry them out in the way that we want them to. We are a sovereign nation. We are federally recognized by the United States government. That means we are able to make our own decisions and govern our own people. We have services for our people. In Miami, Oklahoma, we have our own police force. We issue license plate tags for citizens who live in Oklahoma. 
Um, those of us in Indiana, the state of Indiana is not in favor of us doing that. But in Oklahoma, they, um, you can get your license plate from the tribe if you're a citizen rather than from the state of Oklahoma. We have a preschool for our children. We have many services for our elders. And how do we pay for all that? The government, the services? That's through the Miami Nation Enterprises. It's our economic arm. And we own a diverse portfolio of companies. We own companies that do construction contracting, that make cabinetry, that do electronics utilities work, um, government contracting, a variety of kinds of companies that earn money for not only the operation of our government, but also for that cultural revitalization that has been taking place for the last 25 years or so. Part of that revitalization is just getting us together. In addition to our annual meeting when we come together to vote, we come together at other times. One of our important gatherings is what we call our winter gathering. Um, hopefully will take place in January this year. Uh, we'll see what COVID does. We will do it online if we can't do it um, in person, but we're hoping to, to have an in-person gathering. One of the important things that we do um, is at our winter gathering is dance, our stomp dance. Can't do that online. <laughs> I mean, I suppose we could all dance in our homes, but it's, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. But what we can do online from our homes is storytelling. We have stories that have been passed down to us, and many of those stories we call winter stories because they can only be told in the winter time. And so that's why we tell stories at our winter gathering. Now you notice these storytellers are very young. Storytellers are supposed to be our elders, but because so much of our culture went to sleep most of our elders never learned those stories. But these young people are learning the stories. They're telling the stories. And as we all know, sooner or later, they will be elders. <laughs> and they will be telling those stories to their children and to their grandchildren. And the order will be righted for us once again. Our language has been under revitalization since the 1990s, we're beginning to learn our language again. We have an online dictionary. We have a language learning app. We have classes for our children and for our adults to learn the language. We actually now have some of our little children who are learning the Amiata Wenge, the Miami language, at the same time that they're learning English. I'm very hopeful that within maybe two generations, we will once again have fluent speakers of our language. We have summer camp for our children. We have a week in Oklahoma and a week in Fort Wayne, and hopefully we'll be able to do it in person again this summer. It's a time for our young people to come together from wherever they live and find out how they are connected as Miami people. It's a time for them to learn the language. The children learn songs um, in our language so that they can, can learn. It's easier to learn when you're singing, right? So we do that. They learn about plants and what, what we call those plants and how we use those plants and why they're important to us. Every year has a different theme. We have six years of different themes so that by the time our children get through camp, they have gone through all of the six themes, learning about our history, our culture, our environment. Whoops, just waited too long. We like to play games. We like to play games that our ancestors were playing when the French first encountered us in Wisconsin. We were playing these games and we're still playing them. One of those games is Pekataha Menge. In English, we call it lacrosse. 
It doesn't look a lot like lacrosse. Some people are using modern lacrosse sticks, um, but we have started now playing with traditional sticks. My colleague makes the traditional style sticks. And today, this is an older picture, and today everybody plays with, with the traditional style sticks. You notice there's no pads, no helmets. I think some of those people don't have shoes either. It's great, there's no boundaries, no borders for the playing field. We play men and women, boys and girls, all ages, all together. There's our, that's Chief Langford there, learning to catch the ball with his stick. His grandchildren are playing there too. I have seen a game with 200 people on the field at one time. <laughs> we love it. And we just get out there and have fun. Other games that we play, uh, the Senza Winge, the bowl game, it's a dice game. You toss the, the dice in, in the bowl and how they fall, you get different points. And then the Makasina game, they're now played with these hot pads, essentially, uh, but they originally were played with moccasins. And it's the hide the pebble game. So one side hides the pebble, the other team has to figure out where the pebble is. Um, and the team that hit it, they sing. So trying to confuse, you know, you can't think where it might be if they're singing and distracting you, right? These are games that have been played forever by Miami people and by people from other tribes as well. We love playing these games. One of the other pieces that has been revitalized is our Miami art called ribbon work. Now, many of the Great Lakes tribes do ribbon work, but unique to Miami ribbon work is that our designs are always diamond patterns. Other tribes may use diamond patterns, but they also use floral patterns and other kinds of designs. Ours are always diamond patterns. And starting in the 1990s, we've been revitalizing that. And you can see people are learning to, to sew. And it's not just women. It's men, it's boys. Some of the teenage girls had never sewn anything ever in their lives and they're learning to do ribbon work. Have to teach them how to thread the needle, but they're learning and making ribbon work. But we don't just sew it now. When our ancestors started making ribbon work, they were using diamond designs that had existed for who knows how long, but they were using a new technology silk ribbons. Never had silk ribbons, and they figured out how to cut and fold and sew these silk ribbons into these beautiful patterns. Well, today we're taking those same patterns and we're imprinting them on our, sorry about that, on the screen here, uh, imprinting them on our t-shirts. We are putting them on the back of our cell phone cases, putting them on the bands of our hats. If you see a t-shirt, somebody walking down the street with a t-shirt like that, chances are good they're Miami. These are all things that help us to learn what it means to be Miami. It's not about playing games, it's not about sewing, it's about coming together, learning about our ancestors, revitalizing what they left for us. And so my job as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer is about our identity. It's about who we are as a people. It's about our way of life, our unique perspective that we get from our stories, from our history, from our culture. And it's about preserving what has been given to us for the next generations. Mission Newe, thank you very much. I can take questions if you have time. Okay.
Yeah, if people have any questions, Diane would be glad to entertain those. When you say you had a village on the Vermilion River, was that a sub-tribe of the Miami? Because that was known as the Paint Shop. Right, right. So, I think you guys, some of your tribes, depending on the location, have a different name. Is that correct? So, initially, we all came out of the water together. But as people came to different places, um, one of the one of the, the first groups that came was, followed a man named Wayatanwa, the whirlpool man, because they came were living at a place where there was a whirlpool, and those people became the Wayatanoke, and the place where they lived was the was Wayatanonge. From them, another group left, and they became known as Peangisha. No, the Piankasha. We shared a culture. We shared a language. We were living in separate autonomous villages, and yet we were all one people. But over time, we began to separate. Um, some of those people, uh, the Piankasha, went into Illinois, and there they became the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, the Illinois tribes. Eventually, during the treaty period, other groups separated um, because they could get separate annuities if they were viewed as a separate tribe. Um, and so they were, they were seen as, as part of, of this larger Miami group, and then they weren't, and then they were, and then they weren't. Today, those people, um, uh, are part of the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma. Yeah. I ended up with it. Uh, in my research in our area, in Fountain County, they say it was one of the largest Miami reservations. It would be in the northeast part of Fountain County or the southwest corner of Tickling County. And they say it's one of the last reservations that you guys gave up. Is there any more history on that? Oh, are, are you thinking of Thorntown? Uh, that'd be more. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure my, my the geography you're talking about, but well, it's uh, south of Oldale. It was originally the Shawnee Crown. There's a mound in that area known as the Shawnee Mound, and even the creek there is known as the Shawnee. And then there's some history where this eventually became a Miami reservation. I don't have. I'd have to look. I'd have to look at the uh, the reserve map. To and that's what it's. It's written and stuff in my research that there's a hmm. reservation there. And then there's a map that I have that shows Miami, the lands of the Miami, are in that location. I mean, the, all of Indiana was at one point our land. Um, and as we ceded the various portions, whatever land we had got ceded. Um, the reserve land, the only land that was really officially a reserve land in Indiana. Um, if you remember back in, in the Treaty of 1834, I said that Andrew Jackson didn't like some provisions. Those provisions that he didn't like were individual reserves. They allowed individual Miami people or um, vill individual villages to have land reserved out of what was being ceded and that was their reserve. The whole of Indiana was Miami, and there, other than the Great Miami Reserve, um, there really wasn't any piece of land that uh, was specifically identified as Miami as a whole. They were, they were individual reserves, either to a village or to um, an individual. So I don't know, I'd have to look at a map. I can't envision where you're talking about exactly. So I'd have to look at a, a map to know for sure. Yeah, it's right there on the Northeast County, part of Mountain County, Southwest Corner. Uh, probably right probably close to, I think, Fort Town. It's up in that area somewhere. I mean, if you do your research, you'll see where they talk about the Shawnee Mound. There was a mound named after the Shawnees. And that's where the Shawnees had their villages and stuff at one time. Yes, Shawnee, the Shawnee were here as well, yeah. At 1811, you know, what happened after that, and they kind of disappeared. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, they, they were moved at that time, yes. Did the Miami still gather together somewhere? We do. We gather together in Oklahoma. And now um, we, the tribe owns property in Fort Wayne. And um, so we, ha we have about 820 citizens who live in Indiana today. And so we, we gather together um, people who live in Indiana, because it's very difficult, even under normal non-COVID conditions, it's very difficult for Miami people to get out to Oklahoma. And so, um, yeah, we have various events in Fort Wayne to gather people together. Yes, could you say a little bit more about the sovereignty of the tribe of Oklahoma, what that means? For example, uh, are you subject to U.S. federal laws? Do you have to pay uh, federal income tax and so on? Yes. What, what does sovereignty mean? Okay. So we are a dependent sovereign nation. So we are under the United States. However, the so I'm a citizen of both the tribe and the United States, and I have to pay taxes to the United States. The tribe, as a sovereign nation, does not pay tax to the United States, but all of our citizens do because we have dual citizenship. Um, but anything that happens within the tribe itself, anything that happens on our tribal trust land within our reservation in Oklahoma, that's governed by the tribe. Does that help a little bit? Well, what about the state? Are you, I, are the people who reside in Oklahoma citizens of the state of Oklahoma as well as? They are, yes. So they're, they, yeah, they're, and just I'm a citizen of Indiana as well. However, states, um, don't have the same authority with um, tribes. The, uh, according to the con U.S. Constitution, it's the federal government that has the government-to-government -government relationship with the federally recognized tribes. Um, but um, uh, states, we, we develop relationships with them in various ways, but they don't have the same authority that the federal government has. Yeah. So what's your feeling about reparations for all the broken treaties and all that? Depends on what you're talking about reparations. Um, do I want the state of Indiana back? Sure, <laughs> but I don't expect it. Um, you know, I don't think, I mean, what we really need is to be recognized not just on a government basis, but for people to know the information that I've told you tonight and more. So many people in Indiana have no clue about Miami people. They have no understanding that this was our land. They have no knowledge of why we're not here. They have no knowledge that we didn't leave willingly. To me, and this is my personal opinion, I'm not speaking for the tribe here, but to me, what we really need more than anything is education, that people need to know their history and understand that there is more than one perspective on any of this. I've been telling you tonight our perspective from the Miami tribe. The United States has a different perspective and other tribes have their own perspectives and all different peoples have different perspectives. And somehow we need to educate people to understand that there are different perspectives on these things. That's important. It's also important that entities follow the law. There are federal laws that govern relationships with tribes, and they are often not followed. And they need to be followed, and there need to be consequences when they are not followed. Um, to me, that's what we need. And that's, I don't necessarily think that's reparation. I think that's just fairness and following the law. 
Yeah. I remember talking to you about the, lo the local tribe, Miami, is it the Wea or the, where that name came from? Can you speak a little bit? Yeah. About that? So the Wayatanonge got shortened to Wea. Fort Wiatnan, Lafayette, that was the French pronunciation of Wayatanonge, Wiatnan. Yeah. Yes. How far does that extend down? Pardon? How far roughly does the Wea area extend down? I know we're supposed to have some here. They were primarily in the Lafayette area. Yeah. Um, I think there may have been some further further south. Um, but they all, all the Weas um, either went west and are now part of the Peoria tribe, or um, there were some of them that intermarried with the Eel River Miamis and are now Miamis. I want to give a little credit to your removal or stuff like that. It's interesting, I've been reading up on this mining removal. The Potawatomi was the first group that sat down with the, the government about their removal in Indiana. <laughs> they mentioned the Miami, they were hoping the Miami would be easy like the Potawatomi. They said they kind of indirectly kind of hit it. You guys were pretty stubborn. Yes. <laughs> they were hoping you would go just as easy as the Potawatomi. Well, you quite didn't follow yeah. the rules. I mean, easy is, again, the U.S. perspective. The Potawatomi removal they call the trail of death right, that's so yeah that was 1838 may have been a factor in why we agreed in 1840 you know because we saw them they were our neighbors they were living on the the wabash river next to us we saw that and and but we yeah we held out and we held out and we held out we just kept saying no 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 until we realized that it, it's no good we can't live here anymore but yeah, we were the last tribe to be removed. Yeah, you're kind of stubborn. <laughs> no, we are. We are. It's probably our women, because our women are really stubborn. What about women in the boat? So that's a very interesting thing. We have records from the 1860s showing that our women were voting at our tribal council meetings. When did women in America get the vote? 1920, so 60 years. Before that, if we go clear back before removal and into the, to the 18th century and before, we had female chiefs that ran the villages and male chiefs that ran all the stuff that the men did. Um, so women were equal in power. Um, that kind of changed in the early 1800s because you know, the American government's not gonna work with women. And our women didn't interact with men outside the family anyway. Um, but, and I'm not sure exactly, we're not sure how that transition happened, but certainly by the 1860s we were voting. Now, when women, there were times when Miami women married American men and left the community. So they no longer can vote as Miami women, but they can't vote as American women either. So they kind of lost out. Maybe in a lot of ways, but certainly in, in terms of voting. When did men get the right to vote in American elections? Oh, that's a real <laughs> complicated question because it, it depends on the state. It depends on uh, my, my great-grandfather, Wapanaki Kapwa, uh, also known as Gabriel Godfrey, went round and round and round. They, they said, you know, we're going to tax your land. Okay, then I get to vote. And then he shows up to, he, he, to vote. No, you can't vote. Then you can't tax my land. We're going to tax your land. You know, it, was, it, it, it just went round and round and round. We think probably the reason they didn't let him vote is because they were voting for the wrong party. I, it probably, seriously, it probably had a lot to do with party politics as much as, um, never no, never. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, a, it's very complicated. 1924 was the Indian Voting Act, or not a voting act, I'm sorry, an Indian Citizenship Act. Every Indian in the United States, whether they wanted to or not, was made 
a citizen of the United States. My family continued to fight and, and for decades afterwards said we are not citizens of the United States. Um, but legally, they could, just, they could just force it. But, and so after 1924, um, all Miami people could, could vote. Um, rarely happens today. I know of about three families where both husband and wife are in Miami. Um, again, this assimilation thing is a problem because who do you know? Who do you know who is a suitable marriage partner and, and is, is Miami? They're, you know, if there are only a handful of people or, or you know, even if they're 50 or 100, the chances of, of finding somebody your age who's Miami, you know, the, the, the odds get diminished. And of course, you, we always married out. We'd, you know, marry Miami from other villages. We'd marry the Shawnee. We'd marry the French. That was always our way. So no, we don't do that. Um, and our citizenship does not depend on it. In some tribes, it does. Um, but ours does not. I was wondering, you said you had a village up on the wall, that creek up there by, in about 32 in the county. Uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, you talked about some of your great battles you guys won. Were you involved, do you remember if the Miami were involved with the second battle of Tickmanoo or Spurs defeat? I mean, that was a major, major defeat to the government. I mean, you know, the Battle of 1812, the Battle of Tickmanoo, but they went back in 1812, and it was a major defeat. By that time, we were not. Um, after the Treaty of Greenville, our leadership really said, we're done with fighting. Were there some Miami men who fought with Tecumseh? I'm sure. Tecumseh wasn't there. Well, Tecumseh and later, but those were individuals, it was, but it was not sanctioned by our government. Um, but in 1812, October 8, oh, excuse me, December 1812, the U.S. Army attacked our village down on the, the Mississippi River. Um, and so, you know, we're fighting because they attacked us. Yeah. When you say you lost your culture and the language was pretty much all but gone, did you lose your traditional tribal music as well? Our music we have not been able to recover. Oh. We, the dance, um, like the stomp dance, we call, it the stomp, we call it stomp dance today, but our Miami name for it is the Shawnee dance. Uh, presumably we learned it from the Shawnee in the first place, and so they have retaught it to us. So we have that. We, a lot of, um, music that goes with dances is um, what they call vocables. It's meaningless sounds because tribes would come together and, and, and it wouldn't be just in one language or another. So we, you know, we can pick up some of those. We're starting, a few people have written a couple of songs in Miyamiata Wenge, but no, our, our music is gone. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's sister lives on the Grand Lake Oh. Why? Why is it Cherokee? Because that's Miami. Oh, you, you're talking about in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. So, <clears throat> because. How did it get to be Cherokee? Let me go back here. Where's the that map here? Uh, I'm going to go back. Okay. Ottawa County, Oklahoma, northeastern Oklahoma, has nine tribes in one county. No county in the United States has that many tribes in one county. And look right at the edge of these other tribes, there's the Cherokee. So they were moved here, they were given that land, and then I believe some of that land came actually from the Cherokee 
to create small reservations for these other tribes. Some of it came from the Quapaw, but yeah, the, so the, the Cherokee are there. And that's why, and I think, the, I think Grand Lake, it may be just south of Ottawa County. I'm not sure where the borders are, but I think it's in the next county down. So it's, it is in Cherokee Reservation area. The DNA, if the, the Miami did any DNA uh, swabs in their mouth for like genealogy, tracing back to like certain ancestry, would some of it show like it might have gone, they might have come from the land bridge over into Asia? I don't know. I, that's been the, that was a theory that that's how native peoples came over. Somehow the theory became what everybody thinks. I personally don't believe it. Some people may have come that way. I don't believe that all Native peoples came that way. That, but I have no, I'm not a scientist. I don't have any, any um, knowledge about that, um, definitive knowledge. But um, I, think, I think we probably came a variety of ways over a, a period of time. Um, I don't know what the DNA would show from that perspective. I know that some of the Western tribes do show some connections that way. Were you given your name by the, uh, a naming ceremony? Now, in my case, no. Um, we, are, we are starting to do naming ceremonies um, for Miami people, for, uh, particularly as we name our children. Um, mine came as a, as, um, just a few years ago, so I was an older woman already. And um, I was named by actually one of our tribal leaders that you saw in that, uh, that picture. Um, she, she gave that name to me. Um, so it's, mine's more of a nickname than an official name because I didn't have a naming ceremony. But we do use naming ceremonies um, today. Nothing, nothing. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a, a, a formal gathering where basically we share the name of, this is this person's name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of grade would you give the Indian agents, uh, Catholic and Protestant missionaries to serve the Indians in Indiana, say from 1775 to 1920? That's an interesting question. The, the, even, even the removal, the um, Indian agents, the, the removal agents, D minus to F. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Were there any good ones? Well, there were some that were better than others. Um, William Wells was our Indian agent, and he, um, he had been a captive and when he was 14 and raised among the Miami. And I, I don't understand William Wells, but he did, he did have some con more concern about, and more understanding about us. Um, so um, I think, yeah, he was, was a better one. Um, some people would disagree with me. I think in some ways, Alan Hamilton was um, a, a better Indian agent he had personal interests in this, but I also think he cared about what happened to us. Um, so yeah, there were some that were better than others. Um, it, when you talk about the missionaries, especially in that, the late 1800s, early 1900s, the boarding schools were a horrible thing. Um, what about missionaries like Isaac McCoy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, he started in Armysburg. Yeah. He ended up in Fort Wayne. Yeah. Would have been. Uh, well, he actually started then, at Mariah Creek. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then ended up out in Kansas. Right. Yeah. So, um, some of those missionaries, you know, I mean, they. Most of those missionaries, they were just trying to share their faith, and for the most part, they they weren't forcing us. Most Miami people, some Miami people um, adopted Catholicism early on, the Jesuit missionaries. Um, how much 
you know, if, if Rome had been looking at Miami people, I don't know how, how Catholic they would have thought we were, but, but some Miami people, but there was some uh, 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 adoption of Catholicism. But later on, the Baptists came in. Um, we had Miami Baptist ministers, um, a couple of them here in Indiana, and then um, Thomas Richardville, great-grandson of Jean-Baptiste Richardville, um, out in Oklahoma became a, a, a preacher of most of the people, the Miami people were in his flock, and he also was our chief at the same time. So he, um, and people trusted him. Yeah, so, you know, can we say there's a whole overall? No, but yeah, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> yes. What's your feeling about renaming of the sports teams away from Indian names? I think on, on the whole it's a good thing. I particularly think it's a good thing when the terms are derogatory terms. Um, I also think that the mascots are more of a problem than the names in most cases. Other than those derogatory names, it's the mascots. Because they're comical figures, they're mocking figures, and no other mascots, well, maybe the Irish, but they're all okay with that. Um, <laughs> but none of the others represent living people. And it just perpetuates the idea that we're a people of the past and we don't exist anymore. When I was looking for images um, for the museum of the Miami Potawatomi, because I, I wanted something that was not stereotypical. And you pointed me to an artist who had, I think they have a book at Tippecanoe County Historical mm -hmm. Society. Do you remember the name? Oh, George Winter. George Winter. They actually have, I didn't realize this until recently, what they have in the Tippecanoe County Historical Society are the originals. Yeah. They have his original watercolor drawings, yes. And was he a great artist? No. But I think for the most part, he represented Miami people. That image of um, uh, Maconzaqua. They published a really good book. <coughs> there. Um, that has it's yes. Like the yeah. Plates in it that are really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so now. I'm willing to bet they did not sit for him. He did this from memory. They didn't particularly like, he was staying with them, but they didn't trust him. Um, and again, Miami women just didn't associate with men outside the family. Um, even, even by this period, it was less common. I mean, if you were with a man outside the family, that meant they were gonna be family. Um, so yeah, but George Winter and in the 1820s there was J James Otto Lewis um, also did some some um, drawings. A lot of them at the uh, Treaty of 1826, and so people we dressed for treaties. I mean that's where the ribbon work comes in. People put on their ribbon work and their finery. We're going to go to this treaty. We are going to look good. And you know, you're not wearing ribbon work out in the cornfield, because this takes, it's hard to make it, and it takes a lot of time. So it was events like treaties that we wore that, that finery, and you see it in the Lewis paintings. And they're so different than um, depictions of native people in uh, paintings, like we might have here in Vigo County, we have one in the uh, historical museum that depicts Fort Harrison, and it has, Native people there in the painting, loincloths and and feathers, and not anything like what the paintings reveal. They are actually dressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think about some of the outrageous prices for Indian artifacts? Like some arrowheads and certain artifacts will go for like multiple hundred dollars, like one item or something, and, and, and they can go into thousands of dollars. What do you think about? It? I think it's crazy, but also here's here's the thing about that. Some of those things now arrowheads for the most part are, aren't a problem, but some of those items that are for sale, 
were obtained illegally. Um, some of the items are what are called items of cultural patrimony, mean that they, meaning that they should never have left the tribe. And law um, allows tribes to recover those items. Um, but um, we see catalogs, uh, the French auction houses have things for sale that people are just like, these are ours. You can't, you know, you can't be selling them. But of course, we don't have any control in France either. But, um, but yeah, I, just on a basic, I, I don't get the high prices for those things. But people do seem to value them sometimes. Yeah. Why do you keep track of where the villages work in India? I know you guys have that information. We have some of them. We don't know where all the villages were, and we some of them we know, like Sakiwayonge, we know approximately where it was, but we don't know exactly. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I think we got to um, allow the library to close up for one thing. Be respectful of their time. Thank you, Diane, again. Very.